My name is Jefferson Davis. I'm a uh, PhD student at the University of Kentucky. I'll be talking today about some research that uh, we're conducting uh, under uh, Dr. Christoph Brim. Uh, this research was conducted with the uh, help of my fellow PhD student, Sparsh Ganju, and Dr. Sean Bailey of the University of Kentucky. Um, I'd like to thank, oops, I'd like to thank Blue Waters and the National Science Foundation for their uh, 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 assistance in, in making this research possible. Now, I use blue waters to study uh, turbulence suppression in rotating flows using direct numerical simulation. Uh, we see rotating flows throughout engineering and in nature. Uh, so a firm understanding of these flows is, is of high value to us. Um, so we'll be going over uh, some background on what rotating turbulence is and what the effects of turbulence suppression there is. Uh, also, our simulation setups, uh, the results we've achieved. Uh, some brief discussion of some RANS modeling work that's being done by our collaborators that's making use of the data that we've collected, and also some outlook as to what we're doing on Blue Waters as we speak. Uh, so uh, the first thing we have to answer is, what is turbulence suppression? Now, turbulence suppression is a, uh, a phenomenon that we see in rotational flows um, that, if you look here, um, we see a, a, a reduction in mixing and, and more coherent structures in a flow once it starts rotating, as well as we have a reduction in friction coefficient with rotation um, and a more laminar appearance to the velocity profile. Uh, so a reduction in friction coefficient is fantastic for engineering, and we definitely want to understand this flow, but we can't typically model it with RANS or other techniques very well. So uh, that uh, motivates the direct numerical simulations we're conducting to get a better understanding of this uh, so that we can move forward and, and implement uh, uh, our understanding in engineering applications. Uh, now, uh, experimental work has been done on this since the 1950s, and uh, there's been a, a extensive work in the experimental field, but DNS on this is, is very sparse, uh, and it's all been restricted to low Reynolds numbers flows that aren't really applicable. Um, and our current understanding of this uh, phenomenon is currently restricted to just the identification of the, the really basic uh, uh, mechanisms which cause this, but not really answering the how or why to these mechanisms at all. Um, so we know from linear stability theory that if we take a uh, non-rotating laminar pipe flow and we rotate it, uh, that it destabilizes the flow. It induces turbulence at a lower criti critical Reynolds number. Um, but interestingly, if we do the same thing to a flow that's already turbulent, if we begin to rotate a flow that's already turbulent, we see the opposite effect, essentially. We see a reduction in pressure loss. We see a reduction in friction. And if we rotate the flow fast enough, we can actually see, you can see right here, uh, we see laminar regions appearing in the flow. Uh, so. Uh, understanding this is, has not been achievable in the past, but with the DNS that's capable now because of Blue Waters, um, uh, we're able to, to start to uh, dive into what these uh, phenomena actually are caused by. Uh, so we can break down this flow into two basic regimes. One is your typical pipe flow, and, uh, which is characterized by the bulk Reynolds number based on the bulk velocity here. And then the other one is a, is a purely rotation so rotational cylindrical flow, which is based on the azimuthal Reynolds number determined by the uh, wall velocity. Uh, so if we take a ratio of these two numbers, we get the rotation number n, and we'll be talking a lot about that today because it's highly important to us uh, in categorizing these flows and about the competition between these two regimes. Uh, so moving into our simulation setup, on Blue Waters we conducted simulations at three different Reynolds numbers, 5,300, 11,700, and 19,000. Uh, these were conducted on a periodic domain that's uh, 12 and a half diameters long, and uh, uh, it's done in a rotating reference frame. So rather than rotate the wall, we add a centrifugal and Coriolis force to the flow. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the mesh dynamics uh, uh, of this uh, simulation were determined from previous simulations on non-rotating flows. Uh, to be sufficient for those flows. And since we expect to see a reduction in friction and therefore a reduction in the friction Reynolds number, we expect that these meshes will be uh, better resolved uh, for rotational flows. And we use uh, 
uh, NEC 5000 is our solver, which is a spectral uh, element code, and it's a sixth order spe spectral scheme and, uh, with AMG as our uh, pre-solver to reduce our time. Uh, we also did some scaling on uh, uh, Blue Waters and found that the node ranges we needed scaled pretty well. Um, and uh, that allows us to uh, move the current DNS out of this low Reynolds number range for things that have been conducted in the past and, and move up to higher and eventually very high uh, Reynolds numbers as far as DNS is concerned um, in examining these flows. Now we're doing this in conjunction with experimental work that's, that's currently being conducted at the University of Kentucky under Sean Bailey and you can see some of his experimental apparatus there at the top. Uh, so now into our results. Uh, what you're looking at here, this is a, a typical non-rotating flow. This is a Reynolds number of 19,000. And you can see in the cross section over here uh, that uh, the, the flow towards the center of the flow, this high velocity flow, mixes well with, with the low velocity flow at the wall. Um, and, and we see a lot of uh, sweeps and ejections uh, towards the wall. And then looking at Q criterion over here, it's... Uh, there's very little cohesion to the flow, uh, and uh, it's very random. However, when we rotate this flow, we see some significant differences. So all that entrainment and mixing that we were seeing uh, uh, before is significantly inhibited, and we, we maintain a very low velocity field towards the wall, and this is the reason for some of our uh, reduction in friction. And then when we look at the... Uh, uh, the Q criterion, we see we can start to see some helical structures forming uh, in the flow, uh, showing more cohesion in the flow and, and longer living structures. Uh, now, in past, people have uh, quantified or, or qualified turbulent suppression in a couple of ways. Uh, one is to look at the mean velocity and say that the mean velocity is becoming more laminar, and we definitely see that here as we increase in rotation number, uh, we start to see a more parabolic profile indicative of a laminar flow, uh, and uh, it's highly dependent on rotation rate in, and there's some dependence on Reynolds number, but not much. We see a similar trend in swirl over here, which is the uh, azimuthal velocity multiplied by the radius, uh, So, in, and we see a high dependence on the rotation rate there. Um, another way that we traditionally uh, quantify uh, turbulence suppression is by looking at friction. So here looking at the friction Reynolds number, and I'll focus on this plot to the right because that's been normalized by the non-rotating case uh, at each Reynolds number. So we can kind of see the reduction in friction in each. And we see two very specific zones emerging. Uh, here at what I call moderate, Reynold, uh, moderate rotation rates, that's one or less, uh, we see very efficient uh, reduction in friction, especially at high Reynolds number flows. However, once we advance beyond n equals one, so this is in a range where the, uh, the azimuthal uh, Reynolds number is much higher than the, uh, the bulk Reynolds number, uh, that efficiency changes quite drastically, and we start to see less friction reduction with increasing rotation. Um, now, these, this is the way that turbulent suppression has been quantified in the past, and it's effective in a lot of ways, but it's not very rigorous. Uh, uh, so one is a qualitative look at the shape of the mean velocity profile, and the other is a measure of the friction, which is only determined by the state of the flow at the wall. So we want a measure of turbulence that is dictated by the entire flow, not just by uh, uh, the flow at the wall. Uh, and so for that, we look at turbulent kinetic energy, which is a measure of the energy that's contained in the fluctuations in the flow. And at first glance in this, using a traditional scaling uh, by the bulk velocity squared, we do see reduction uh, close to the wall, and that's here on the left, uh, in this peak. But we also see an increase towards the center of the flow, and that might suggest that we actually see more turbulence in a rotating flow. But there's a couple of problems here. The first is that uh, this is a pipe flow, and so as we integrate this, uh, areas close to the center really don't contribute much whereas areas close to the wall uh, contribute a lot to the integral of turbulent kinetic energy. So now if we multiply by the radial position, we get the value of, of that integral contribution, and we can see that there is still an increase towards the center of the flow, uh, but it's, it's, it's much less than, than what we see uh, before we uh, weight by the radius. Additionally, we, 
uh, oh, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, the total integral of turbulent kinetic energy here uh, using this scaling by the bulk velocity squared. And we do see some reduction in turbulent kinetic energy at low uh, Reynolds numbers, or, I'm sorry, low rotation rates. But then we start to see an apparent increase in turbulent kinetic energy as we go to high rotation rates. And this, at a glance, would suggest that turbulent suppression is not present in these flows. Uh, whereas our mean velocity profile and our friction both suggest that they do. But again, the scaling is limited because so far we've been divided by the bulk velocity squared, which is the mean kinetic energy for a non-rotating flow. But now we have a mean component in the azimuthal direction. And so when we normalize by the total mean kinetic energy, we see that, in fact, there is a decrease uh, in, in the turbulent kinetic energy in this flow, uh, at high Reynolds numbers at least, for every single rotation rate. And that that decrease continues to amplify as we go to higher and higher rotation rates. Uh, we did have a case, uh, 5300 at n equals 1, where we did see an increase in turbulent kinetic energy. Um, this is likely just a low Reynolds number effect. Uh, as we go to higher and higher Reynolds numbers, uh, we're seeing a, a steeper and steeper decrease uh, in uh, turbulent kinetic energy. Uh, so we can say that turbulent suppression does exist in these flows. Uh, now, to dive in a little more to what's happening to the turbulent kinetic energy, we can look at the turbulent kinetic energy budget terms. And I'll just focus on two today because we're limited for time. Uh, but I'll look at turbulent kinetic energy production, and this is the creation of turbulent kinetic energy from the mean flow, and then turbulent kinetic energy dissipation, which is the destruction of turbulent kinetic energy uh, by molecular forces. And we see at moderate rotation rates, so that's n equals 1 or less, uh, we have a very clear trend of a, a decrease in production in the flow, and then a, also a decrease in the magnitude of dissipation. Uh, note this is negative, so decrease in magnitude is up. Uh, but that's only for those moderate rotation rates. We see very different behavior once we go beyond n equals 1. And we start to see, it's actually clearer in this next plot, uh, this is uh, uh, interscale turbulent kinetic energy production and dissipation. Uh, and, and here we see, whoops, uh, here we see a shift in the peak in production as we go to uh, uh, higher rotation rates and drastically different behavior for dissipation. Whereas the rest of, of uh, uh, these rotation rates collapse pretty well onto a universal profile, which is expected for pipe flow. So this suggests that this case is is no longer qua uh, quantified well as a pipe flow, but instead it's more of a rotating cylinder flow. Uh, and the other terms of the, the turbulent kinetic energy budgets also support this and show similar trends, but we're going to skip those for today. And uh, now we'll look at somewhere where this data is al already being used, and that's the RANDS modeling uh, being conducted by our collaborators in Oxford. I've picked out a couple of plots here that show some really, really bad uh, uh, comparisons between their data and ours. They've got a lot that are better, but I wanted to pick on them today. Um, and you can see that uh, this is very much ongoing work uh, and, and a very difficult uh, uh, goal to achieve. Uh, and so they're still actively working on this, and they're very, very starved for data. Uh, so here in particular, this is a developing turbulent flow, uh, rotational turbulent flow, over a very long pipe domain. And their trends not quantitatively, but qualitatively, compare well with experimental data in that you see a decrease here in, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, damping coefficient, but that also compares well with, with older uh, RANDS models that we know are bad. Uh, beyond the experimental data, we get drastically different um, uh, trends, and honestly, we don't know which one is right, or if either of them are right. So we need data beyond this, and that motivates what we're doing on Blue Waters now, which is a complete uh, simulation of developing rotational turbulence over a long domain. So we generate non-rotating turbulent flow over a 12 and a half diameter domain, and then we feed that in to a 125 diameter domain and allow it to develop in a rotation, rotating pipe. Uh, this is an incredibly expensive uh, simulation 22 billion points, 2 million time steps, uh, 10.4 million node hours on blue waters. Um, and the data output, which I'll skip, but it's hundreds of terabytes, uh, 
Um, so that really already answers the question of why Blue Waters. We can't do this anywhere else. Right? Uh, Blue Waters allows us to do the studies we've already conducted, which wouldn't have been possible in the past, and it's allowing us to do the studies that we're conducting now, which some would even say would be impossible now. This is developing turbulence in DNS. This is something that's not typically done. And so, uh, in summary of our work, we conducted DNS over a range of Reynolds numbers, uh, higher than has been conducted before. Uh, we captured a lot of turbulence statistics, more than I had time to talk about today. Uh, we found an effective way to quantify turbulence suppression, and our data is already being used to help with uh, Im improving RANS models uh, to get into the hands of engineers and start designing better products. Uh, in the future, we are, as we speak, conducting simulations of the full reverse transition process, um, uh, which will uh, answer a lot of questions in this field uh, and create a lot more. Uh, if you'd like to hear more, I'll be at the AAA Aviation Forum speaking about this in a little more detail. And we've also got a couple of con conference papers down here if you're interested in a read. That's it.